From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Monday, March 28th. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. Bonds brace for impact. The sell-off continues as the 10-year Treasury yield hits 2.5%. The 530s curve inverts for the first time since 2006, signaling concerns about growth. In Japan, the BOJ steps in, driving the yen to its weakest level in seven years. Stealth rally, Bitcoin erases its 2022 losses with a climb above 47,000. We'll have more on the trajectory for the cryptocurrency and the prospects of a spot ETF with Michael Sonnenschein, Grayscale CEO. And the talk and the walk back. The Biden administration scrambles to reframe the president's remarks calling for Putin's removal from power. The Kremlin calls his words alarming and says no progress has been made in talks with Ukraine, which continue in Turkey this week. From New York, I'm Kaylee Lines with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. And Guy, on this Monday, we have our eye on the bond market. We do. And trying to figure out exactly what the equity market thinks of the bond market, I think is one of the big questions uh, that everybody is trying to get the answer to, Kaylee. We came in this morning, we were kicking this around, we were trying to understand this tension, this threat potentially posed by the inversions you just mentioned to the equity market. And the equity market at the moment seems to have a fairly clear answer. We're going to continue to go higher. We're going to continue to buy stocks. So Kaylee and I's question of the day. My, Kaylee, and my question of the day, if I get the grammar right, <laughs> how long can stocks ignore uh, an inverted curve? So, Kaylee, here's my thoughts on this. Are recessions bad for stocks? Mm. Yes. Is an inverted curve a signal of an impending recession? Well, given the state of the Fed's balance sheet and just how big it is at the moment, I'm not so sure about that one. If we are going to get a recession, when should stocks react to that inverted curve? Well, the sense seems to be maybe not instantly. So maybe, maybe the market's reaction does make sense right now. Yeah, and that's the view from JP Morgan as well, Guy. Given the lag time, if you have a yield curve inversion, it's still a long time uh, into the future when you get that recession. But it really is a question now of whether or not an inverted curve is a good signal of a recession or if it has kind of lost its ability uh, to serve that purpose. Yeah, you think about the way that the Fed's balance sheet is structured at the moment, you can kind of make that argument. Let's kick it around uh, with the slightly wider group. Lisa Rabanowitz, co-host of Bloomberg Surveillance, Christine Aquino, market editor for Bloomberg EMEA, joining us to discuss. Christine, let me start with you. You're standing next to me, so we'll start here first. What do you think? The, the argument is that we've got an inverted curve, we're going to get a recession, that should be bad for stocks. Yet there are so many completing factors in that chain of thought at the moment that the line doesn't seem quite so clear. Absolutely, Guy. You know, I think the, the the signal that we should read from this curve inversion this time around may not be the same as what previous instances of an inversion have given us because the bond market has changed completely, Guy. This is not your grandfather's bond, work, bond route anymore. You know, this is a completely different um, situation that we're in. A lot of other different factors, of course, contributing to all of that is what we've seen from central banks over the past decade. Just a tremendous amount of buying that has really influenced the bond market in a singular way. And so it's really difficult to kind of make that conclusion now just because it's such a different signal. And as far as how much it impacts stocks or when it will impact stocks, I think it's really, it has a long way to go because we haven't really seen the impact of higher bond yields yet filtering its way through the real economy. Well, and something else we haven't seen, Lisa, is an actual inversion of the curve that everybody really watches, which is the twos tens. Is that what would ultimately maybe make the difference to this equity market? Maybe, although honestly, I keep thinking about what my Michael Darda of MCAM Partner said uh, this morning where he came out and said, we're looking at the wrong yield curve. If you actually take a look at the gap between 10-year yields and three-month yields, it's actually widened to the widest going back to 2016. What does this tell us? It tells us the Fed hasn't actually tightened all that much yet. In fact, conditions yeah. are still incredibly loose. And if you actually look at a number of different measures, whether it's credit spreads, whether it's stocks, uh, whether it's, uh, frankly, just borrowing costs more broadly, they have gone down at a time when inflation is going up. They have still been buying uh, you know, bonds up until uh, just earlier this month. Looking at all of this, how much does this leave us with truly tightened conditions? And does that mean that stocks will be really vulnerable, Kaylee, uh, when we actually see some of the hikes that everyone's predicting? 
OK, so, so Lisa, we have to wait. You have to go to the FCOM function. You have to look at the broad measures of financial conditions. Are you now saying that will be a better predictor of a recession coming forward as well or just a buy-sell signal on stocks? Honestly, I'm just telling you what other people are saying. What I'm looking at is also other indicators that are on the ground that also are a bit concerning as to the when is, is difficult to say. I will point out, though, on Friday, Guy, we actually saw research out of the Federal Reserve themselves saying exactly this. Don't fear the yield curve. It's not an indicative of necessarily a recession in its own right. And if you take a look at these other measures, they are steepening. So clearly the Fed is trying to explain away the flattening yield curve that a lot of people are looking at and raising alarm bells, which makes you wonder, OK, basically this isn't going to necessarily stop them from going ahead with some of the tightening plans. And then how, again, will stocks respond when they start to enact some of what they have uh, basically been saying that they're going to do? Well, and Christine, we can talk about the stock's response to that, but also in the bond market, given how far we have already come, I mean, we're up, what, 130-something basis points on the two-year yield already, and it's only not even the end of March. How much further could the bond market sell off or the flattening of curves go as we see the Fed actually acting on what it says in the dot plot? Well, Kaylee, on the question of how much further, I think it's really important to take note of where the Fed terminal rate is going to end up. I think that's really crucial for kind of drawing a line underneath this bond sell-off that we're seeing, because that would really kind of give you a sense of when the turn in the Fed policy path that we're currently on will start to take place. And it's possible that even if, you know, that, that peak in the Federal Reserve terminal rate doesn't come for another year or another um, 16 months or so, it's possible that markets will start are anticipating that yep. months ahead. And so that's really something to keep an eye on for a potential marker of relief here for bonds. Lisa, the other thing that really intrigues me is the fact that the Fed is basically signaling that growth is stronger than we first thought. I, we're going to have to step in and be more aggressive here to slow this juggernaut down. OK, you raised a really interesting question, which is, do they think that growth is going to accelerate or do they think that inflation is going to accelerate and be such yep. a concern that growth will remain strong enough to justify their moving very quickly? And I would argue it's the latter. And the question that I have is, how strong is that economy? How much momentum is there, especially as you get the one-two punch of both a fiscal withdrawal, right, which we're seeing from the U.S. government, at the same time that you're getting this stagflationary shock from the uh, war in Ukraine by Russia? So all of these sort of, uh, the stew of factors the Fed is looking at and saying, all we know is we have to move. They haven't yet, of course, uh, but they have to. And I think that, you know, when you ask whether stocks are paying attention, my question again is, are they paying attention to the Fed hiking or that the Fed is going to need to slow demand, to slow the economy much more than people expected in order to affect any kind of uh, any kind of dampening of inflation? OK, so that's on the Fed side. And you could argue that the BOE, the ECB are also in that hawkish, at least moving toward tightening ca camp. Christine. Kuroda and the BOJ are not. That has become very, very clear. I'm wondering what you make of Japan's moves, the BOJ's moves overnight to drain in JGBs. Well, Kaylee, I think the fact that they felt compelled to act not only once but twice today to cap those bond yields really tells you everything that you need to know in terms of how worried the BOJ is uh, of this latest move. I think the Bank of Japan has really proven time and again it's a central bank that really does not like any market moving much faster than it is comfortable with. And they have proven time and again that they will act against any of those rapid moves. That's what we saw today. But more importantly, I think it's really uh, traders kind of turning their sights to BOJ as one of the more dovish end of the central bank uh, spectrum yeah. that we've seen and really daring them to finally get on that normalization train. But the, the other question that occurs to me here is clearly there's a carry trade involved in what is happening. Carry trades normally work in low volatility environments. This is a high volatility environment. How risky is this trade as you put it on? Very, very risky guy because, again, you know, given the, the broader environment, you know, you would usually think of, for instance, emerging markets as the, the usual targets for these carry trades, for instance, right? But in this sort of environment where the yen is doing what it is, uh, hitting its weakest levels in, in a decade or more, and then the potential targets for those carry trades, would be, which would be emerging markets, still also undergoing a very volatile, vulnerable period because of the broader risk offish sort of environment that we're in. I think on both sides of that trade, on both sides of that equation, there is a lot of risk that perhaps investors would be brave. Only the brave ones would be uh, <laughs> willing to take it at this point. 
All right, Bloomberg's Christina Kino and Lisa Abramowitz, thank you both for joining us. Now, coming up, it was a time of bell-bottom pants, vinyl records, and oil embargoes. That is the last time we saw inflation like this. We'll talk about what that means for investors with Linda Dussel, Senior Equity Strategist at Federated Hermes, next. This is Bloomberg. As the shift in the risk moves much more towards inflation, equities, at least relatively speaking, are more attractive. They're a real asset. The dividends will grow over time with inflation. The overall valuation of parts of the equity market, I think, look reasonably uh, attractive. That was Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs earlier on Bloomberg Television saying equities can weather the current bond route, which takes us back to our question of the day. How long can stocks ignore an inverted curve? Let's ask Linda Dussel, Federated Hermes senior equity strategist. Linda, is the clock ticking or are we good to go no matter what the curve does? Well, first of all, we at Federated Hermes would disagree that we have an inverted curve uh, because history shows that you want to look at the three months to the 10 year for clues on whether or not the curve is telling us the market's weakening into a recession. And that's a steep yield curve. I think somebody in the previous sec uh, segment just mentioned that. We don't think that you're seeing evidence yet from the yield curve that there's a recession on the horizon. What you see now is a booming economy uh, with very tight supplies versus demand, too much cash in the system. The Fed has to really walk a tight rope, and that is what we think is the biggest risk this year, is the Fed. Can it walk a tight rope and give us a soft landing so we can get this inflation down fairly dramatically? So what kind of odds would you put on that, Linda? If, if a recession is bad for stocks, what yes. chance is there that the Fed delivers a recession here rather than a soft landing? How would you handicap this? Yeah. Yes, yes, and of course, the Fed is the one who's given us recessions historically by going too far, by tightening too far. Unfortunately, we've been in an unprecedented time with um, unprecedented amounts of stimulus, and now they have to try and take it away as it's been spectacular. So the odds are not, the odds are not good. And I think that's what's going on. If even this rally that we've seen in recent days um, has been more of a defensive rally, and you've seen areas like utilities break out. You know, some of the more defensive areas in the marketplaces where people think it may be safe to invest money. And we're likely to be range bound now until we we can get some sense as to whether inflation has come down. That's a big question mark for the rest of this year. Well, and obviously, speaking of the Federal Reserve and of inflation, it, there is a theory that the bond market is going to do worse in an environment where the Fed is acting aggressively to rein in inflation. Therefore, your best bet is equities. Where do you come down on that kind of Tina thesis in this moment? Yes, uh, we, we've, we've said Tina for quite some time. I mean, we would never suggest that somebody be completely out of government bonds, U.S. government bonds are the safe haven for the world. And, and uh, pretty much everybody is you know, is, is an agreement that yields are going up. If yields go up and you hold bonds, you're going to lose money. And therefore, there is no alternative to owning equities. And so the best thing we can do in an environment like this, when we don't see a recession on the horizon near term, when we see long-term interest rates are climbing, as they should do, and the Fed's taking away the easy money, is to find pockets of the market that you know, where the, you know, where it's, it's less expensive, where you have some things on sale and you can always find some things on a relative sale. So we're, yep. we're suggesting numerous areas. Mm -hmm. So, so Kaylee's very excited about the return of flares and bell bottoms. <laughs> I, she's really looking forward to it. She wants to get back to the seventies. Linda, are we going back to the seventies? Well, it's funny. I, I was, I lived in the seventies. Those were, uh, those were very interesting times. We raced to buy a home when, when the uh, double digit interest rates came down a little bit. Little did we know we'd go 40 years with interest rates declining. Therefore, two whole generations never saw anything like what we're seeing right now. This is not stagflation. This is a booming economy where you have record job openings today. Uh, we have record numbers of people working where, uh, where businesses have strong profit margins and are able to push through price increases at an yeah. unprecedented rate. Stagflation needs a re uh, needs unemployment to go up. You know, unemployment is going down, so we shouldn't worry about that 
just yet. This is not the 1970s, not yet. It's not the 1970s, so bell bottoms are still in, though. Skinny jeans, Guy can <laughs> confirm, have been uh, canceled, at least for now, until that trend comes back around as well. Linda, you were talking about pricing power there and the ability for companies to pass on the higher input costs they are facing. Do you anticipate that inflation will get to a level, level that will start to see consumer pushback and the tolerance for those yeah. higher prices start to not be there? Well, absolutely, that's true. And of course, this is most important for the lower income cohort, which is one of my biggest worries is that the price of, of energy and food supplies is going up. And this is what's really, really difficult, particularly in a midterm election year uh, for the lower income cohort. So that is very much a problem. You're also seeing people uh, looking to buy homes that are saying, all right, sticker shock, this is, I can't do this. There's no way that I can do this. And that pulls back. And we know that there is, you know, there's no better uh, solution to high prices than high prices and demand goes down. So we're seeing that ripple through our economy a bit. Um, but now service prices are going up, as we know, as the economies open more and more. So on a scale of one to 10, how much risk are you advising? Is this an economy you want to be all in on growth? You don't want to worry about the inflation. You want to be owning stocks with an exposure to that growth. Give me some of those names. Yes. Where would I want yes. to be right now, Linda? Yeah, yes, and, and your comment about should we go all in? We're, we're in a point right now, we at Federated Hermes, where we're suggesting an equity overweight, but the amount of our equity overweight is really as low as it was when we were just coming out of that 2008, 2009 recession. So we're basically in a neutral situation right now. And what we're suggesting people do in a neutral situation is, you know, you want to under, underweight bonds, interest rates are going up. It's not, it's not favorable at all, but you want to look for areas where there is value and there is still value in the high quality dividend or in pockets of the marketplace. So you saw starting the fourth quarter of last year, the staple sector, which you know, this whole area has been avoided completely. Staples started to go up lately. You've seen utilities start to go up. Energy patch has some good, pretty good yields in it. And uh, there's no particular end at the moment in sight there. But look at high quality pharmaceuticals. Look at telco stocks. Nobody much cares about those either. And so uh, so these are some of the areas where we think there is still value to be had and still in some of the staples areas. High quality dividend oriented right. stocks can give you the yield that you want. It's a turtle wins the race type thing. It's not worried. Yeah, fangs are going to be back in play again after we get some of this volatility out. People sell some more of those. Fangs lost all the performance that they gained in through the pandemic. So they're back kind of on sale, but we're more in the value camp than growth camp at Federated Hermes. Linda, it's great to catch up. Really appreciate the time today. Linda Dussel of Federated Hermes. Really appreciate the time. What are we going to talk about next? Tesla looking for shareholder approval for its second stock split in a couple of years. Shares are up on the news, which, as John Ferrer has been pointing out, in some ways seems nonsensical. But there is maybe method to the madness. We'll talk about this next. This is Bloomberg. Shares in Tesla up to date. The electric car maker plans to ask for shareholder approval for a stock split. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow is in San Francisco. We need to talk about this. We need to talk about what's happening in Shanghai um, and probably the fact that Elon Musk appears to have COVID again. But let's certainly focus, first of all, Ed, on what is happening with the stock split. Musk talks about this as being an accessibility issue, i.e. split the stock allow more people to buy it, the units are cheaper. In theory, mathematically, this should have no impact. My question is, why now? Why do this right now? Do they feel the stock needs a boost or is it something else? The, the timing is interesting. Of course, they communicated that they wanted to do a stock split via a tweet, but in the subsequent 8K filing, they said they would give more details uh, in advance of the annual shareholders meeting, right? We don't have a date for the annual shareholders meeting. In past years, it's been in October, June, September. Wall Street analysts seem to think it will be in October. Um, it, you're right that it's about lowering the barrier to entry. You know, Elon Musk and other Tesla executives have talked about how the retail investor 
which are often people that own Tesla cars, Tesla products, understand the company so much better than Wall Street does, right? He doesn't really give uh, a, a lot of credit to, to institutional investors on how they analyze the company and its different units. So, you, you know, they did this in August of 2020, a subsequent run up in the stock followed, but mm -hmm. very much about, it appears, lowering the barrier to entry. All right, well, let's talk about Tesla's actual business, which at the end of the day is producing cars. That's going to be right. harder to do in China this week until April 1st. That Shanghai factory had to close due to those COVID curves. Can you just contextualize how important that is to the company? Yeah, so Tesla's Shanghai plant accounts for almost half of annual production at the moment, right? Because Austin and Berlin, the new plants are coming online, but we don't know what their installed capacity is annually, and we don't know how many vehicles they're going to produce in the near time. What you have in Shanghai is a, a first phase of a lockdown, four days through April 1st, and sources tell us that Shang in Shanghai, Tesla has halted production. East of the Huangpu River is where Tesla's located in Shanghai. And, and the reason your question is so good, uh, Kaylee, is because Tesla has spent a lot of time on localizing supply chain in China. And it's not just about the volume of vehicles that Tesla produces there, but also the profit profile. The margins on Model Ys and Model 3s out of China are much higher than they are out of Fremont, California, because the cost of doing things is cheaper there. The technology in the plant is more advanced. So if they are to halt for several days, it could have a substantive impact because they've had a lot of momentum there in building cars, not just for domestic market, but exporting them as well. All right, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow in San Francisco, thank you so much. And Guy, we didn't get a chance to ask Ed about it, but Elon Musk tweeting today, he supposedly, operative word being supposedly, has COVID again. Although I feel like it's like a lot of how us felt after we've been previously COVID positive and then get it again with a new variant. It's not a great feeling. Not a great feeling, but he seems to be uh, having his mind certainly focused elsewhere. I, I, I don't know as an investor, Kaylee, how you look at Tesla. It was really interesting what Ed said about people who own the cars maybe have a better understanding of the business than Wall Street does right now. Wall Street must be really confused. Getting tweets out of left field, <laughs> trying to figure out what is happening out of Shanghai. Yeah. Does Elon Musk having COVID have any material impact? I don't know. Really hard to analyze. And maybe should, just go out and buy a car. And should Tesla be trading at the multiple it is? I think an open question. Coming up, we'll turn to geopolitics and domestic politics. Terry Haynes, Pangea Policy founder, will be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. We're an hour into the U.S. trading session. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking the moves. And Abigail, I got to say, stock action, not all that exciting. It seems to be in other asset classes today. It does indeed. And we'll be getting to one of those asset classes in a moment. But first, taking a look at what is working for stocks. We do have tech outperforming that NASDAQ 100 up about four tenths of one percent, being helped out by Tesla up six percent as the company is proposing a possible stock split, which, of course, makes it more friendly to retail investors, helps the optics, takes it from uh, a greater than a thousand dollar stock per share to uh, some number well below. The last time I think it was cut down to about 400, up 80% since that last stock split back in August of 2020. Amazon up 1%, now higher on the year. Tech, of course, being helped out as yields fall. That 10-year yield down about three basis points right now at 2.43%, still unbelievably high. As for what's not working, what Kaylee's talking about, I think, oil. Take a look at this, down 7% WTI crude, weighing on the Bloomberg Commodity Index, down 2.5%, and weighing on many of the energy movers, including Apache and Halliburton. As for oil, we've been watching these technicals closely. It still seems as though we are going to see a move back from that parabolic uh, uptrend. Here we have oil relative to its 200-day moving average, not showing the 50-day moving average at about $95 per barrel. It seems as though oil will very quickly go down to that $95 per barrel mark. But it really seems likely, as happened the last two times that the RSI went uh, down to oversold territory, that we could see crude oil go back to its 200-day moving average. Of course, it's rising. So right now, guys, it's right below $80 per barrel. But there are many who continue to think that you could see oil uh, go even lower than that. Stay tuned. But it's certainly another uh, tailwind for stocks. Plenty to think it could go a lot higher as well. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Abigail Doolittle, let's talk about uh, what what is being perceived as a gaffe over the weekend from the president? The Biden administration basically spending the last few hours backtracking after the president made this remark at the end of his speech in Poland. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot 
remain power. Bloomberg's Amory Hordern is in Warsaw for us, joins us now. Amory, clearly being perceived as a mistake, but was it a reflection maybe of what the current thinking is within the White House? So, yes, it was a mistake to say it, but is this actually a fair reflection of what is being thought about within the corridors of power in, in D.C.? I'm not sure we can go as far to say that just yet, Guy, because the White House has done a lot to not exactly say they don't agree with what the president was saying, but just say this is not U.S. policy. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken made that very clear yesterday while he's on a visit in Israel, saying this is not U.S. policy. That's not what the president was trying to reflect. Also, it's not U.S. policy in Russia or anywhere else for that matter. Potentially, one U.S. official offered up that this was the president maybe speaking a little bit from the heart after the fact that he had just met refugees who have fled Ukraine, who have friend, fled the assault that what Russia is doing on that country. And also, we should note, President Biden, when asked as he was meeting those refugees, what does he now think of President Putin? And he said he's a butcher. So this just goes a little bit further from already that heightened rhetoric. Well, and obviously the allies that the president and the U.S. has weren't all too pleased with these remarks. Anne-Marie, you had Emmanuel Macron of France, for example, warning against any kind of escalation, including a verbal escalation. Did it do any damage to the diplomatic efforts and advancements that had been made in the prior days on his trip to Europe? Well, that's the concern of some of the uh, so some of these leaders in Europe, especially Emmanuel Macron, as you said there. He said there should be no escalation, verbal or not. Then you had Olaf Scholz saying the president said what he said, but he said it doesn't reflect what NATO, including the United States and the president, think in terms of trying to move forward in regime change. That is not the goal. That's what they are, they are saying. And when it comes to the Kremlin, while they'll say that this is narrowing the windows of opportunity for diplomacy and it doesn't help, we should note that President Putin already thinks this. He's thought this for years. There were mass protests in Russia in 2011, and he directly thought that the United States was behind this. He thought the United States was also behind the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004. So for the Kremlin, hearing this would not be something new. But there is a concern that potentially, at least when it comes to the coverage of it, what the president said, those last nine words, really overshadowed the entire speech and his entire trip. All right, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in Warsaw. Thank you so much for your great reporting over the last several days. Now, joining us now with more is Terry Haynes, Fangia Policy founder. So, Terry, give us your take. How much damage did that one remark from the president do over the weekend? Well, I'm sorry to say, Kaylee, that I think it's a big deal. Uh, for a variety of reasons. You know, presidents, regardless of party or policy, should always be precise about uh, what American policy is. And, you know, the best thing you can say about this is it was Im imprecise, but it was imprecise on a very grave matter, the matter of uh, whether regime change or not. Uh, and, you know, it's, a, and it's not a small thing. If you look back historically, for example, you know, the entirety of the Cold War uh, we had normalized relationships with Russia. We had a normalized relationship with China since 1971. Uh, you know, we have not called for regime change uh, uh, lightly in uh, in most cases. So to do it now is bad. To do it off the cuff, frankly, is worse uh, because then you've got the backfilling and all the rest. Yep. You come from the NATO summit, which actually compounds it because uh, you you know all the all the allies thought they knew where they were going uh, when they you know left the summit and uh, hours later the president is uh, is freelancing uh, you know generally speaking it's not a good thing it drives you know and it has consequences it drives uh, okay. China more towards Russia and vice versa all kinds of things Terry do you think it was a mistake and I asked the question with relation to the sanctions policy going forward if we were to see a ceasefire if we were to see the war in Ukraine coming to an end do you think the the fact that Putin would still be in power in Russia would mean largely that those sanctions would remain in place. I'm just wondering what the conversation is within the White House, what the conversation is in Washington, D.C. In order to get the sanctions lifted, does the war have to end or do we need to see regime change ultimately in Russia? Well, I think the United States, start with the, start with the end. I think the United States policy is that the 
sanctions continue uh, until uh, President Putin is no longer there. Uh, but that, you know, okay. it, it, you know, and now the White House is backfilling and saying, well, of course, we're not interested in regime change. But the said to your other question, the, the question of what United States policy is, as it's coming from the White House, uh, has been has been a moving target for for quite a long time. Uh, firstly, we had to see what the incursion was, the nature of the incursion. Then, you know, then we changed that. Then, just in the last week, we've got we've had three different uh, uh, gaffes from the president, not just one. Uh, the first one was the purpose of the sanctions, whether it was deterrence mm-hmm. or not. Uh, there's long, you know, the, the administration had been saying deterrence for weeks, and all of a sudden, okay. the president's no, that sort of thing. So, you know, they, they need to get their acts together. Sorry, just can I, can I just back, come back to the first part of that answer, though? Yeah, please. If sanctions stay in place until there is regime change, hmm. once the war is over, is the, is the objective of those sanctions regime change? Because that would, you could certainly draw a fairly clear line, therefore, between one and the other. And therefore, yeah. that would imply, tacitly, that, that the policy of the White House, the policy of America, is regime change. The most, uh, a very good question, and the most direct answer I can give you is that we do not know what the policy of the United States is today uh, to, to answer that question. Mm. Uh, you know, certainly there will be an interest in wanting to maintain uh, sanctions to ensure good behavior. So, you know, now we're back to deterrence, uh, yay or nay again. Uh, but, uh, you know, n- you know, things are not going to be, uh, you know, go back to, uh, to square one uh, pre-invasion uh, as a result of any sort of ceasefire or final peace agreement. Uh, I think there will continue to be Russian sanctions uh, for quite some time. Uh, and again, I say I, I don't think we know what the policy of the United States would be going okay. forward in that circumstance. All right, that's on the foreign policy side of things, Terry. Let's talk about domestic policy as well, because later on today we are expecting the president to unveil his budget proposals. I know you don't think that it is a big deal to the markets, but the billionaire's tax component in it, could that be? Yeah, I I, I put out a note this morning just basically saying, as you know, saying, you know, the budgets do not matter, regardless of the president, regardless of anything. They just don't matter. Because what matters is the spending deals that uh, between Congress and the administration. The budgets are, are, are wish lists uh, and partisan wish lists at that, regardless of the president. So there's that. Um, the billionaire's tax, though, I think uh, does not, almost certainly does not uh, become law as proposed. But uh, what I've been telling markets is all along is that some some sort of tax on the wealthy uh, ends up about 60 percent today ends up uh, becoming law uh, because what Democrats will want to do is they will want to pass something called Build Back Better, regardless, almost regardless of what that is. And by the way, I think the, uh, the thing that the markets will be surprised at is it will continue to involve uh, some sort of drug pricing regulation. But there will be a very small Build Back Better uh, piece of legislation that will be paid for in part by uh, some sort of tax on the wealthy. And I think it will be less uh, grandiose than the one that the president's proposed now, uh, which isn't even particularly big. Three hundred and sixty billion over ten years yep. is you know, it was a thirty uh, it was thirty-six uh, billion tax uh, haul. So uh, it, it'll be tiny. But you know, they're all all Democrats are aligned on the question. Of, I think, except for maybe Senator Sinema, uh, on you know being okay with additional taxation of some kind to do some list of small things. Uh, I think they want that going into the election, and uh, and today I think yep. it's likely not that they get it. Bashing millionaires into billionaires, even into the midterms, maybe something they think is a good idea. Terry, great to get your your uh, updates. Really enjoyed the note this morning. Thank you very much indeed, Terry Haynes, Pangea Policy Founder. Thanks very much. Coming up, Bitcoin has had something of a stealthy rally over the last couple of weeks. It's wiped away this year's losses. We're going to talk to the CEO of Grayscale. Michael Sonnenstein joining us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Angel Feliciano. You're looking at the principal room. Coming up, Libby Cantrell, PIMCO head of public policy. That's on Balance of Power at 12 p.m. in New York. This is Bloomberg.
keeping you up to date with the news from around the world, here is the first word. I'm Angel Feliciano. The city of Shanghai will be looked at, we locked down in two phases to conduct a mass testing blitz for the coronavirus. The outbreak is challenging China's zero tolerance approach to the virus like never before. Residents will be barred from leaving their homes. Meanwhile, public transport and car hailing services will be suspended. The U.S. says the revival of a nuclear deal with Iran may not happen soon. Iran has made a number of requests recently, including that Washington removes the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps from its list of terrorist organizations. The U.S. is reassessing the political cost of reviving the 2015 pact. The agreement limited Iran's nuclear activities in return for sanctions relief, including on oil exports. And a stunning moment at the Oscars. Actor Will Smith slapped presenter Chris Rock and was later awarded the Oscar for Best Actor. Rock had joked that Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, could be in the next G.I. Jane movie. That was a reference to her very short hair. She has alopecia, a disease which causes hair loss. Will Smith later apologized but didn't mention Rock. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Angel Feliciano. This is Bloomberg. Kaylee. Angel, thank you. I would love to discuss Will Smith and Chris Walk and everything that went down at the Oscars. But unfortunately, we do need to talk about the markets and focus on cryptocurrencies in particular because Bitcoin has now erased all of this year's losses. That has the cryptocurrency bulls predicting it could go past 50,000 soon. Joining us now, the CEO of Grayscale, Michael Shaunashine. So, Michael, break of 47,000. We've obviously been in a range for basically the duration of this year. What is your assumptions about the trajectory as we move forward through 2022? Well, it's been a choppy start to the year, not just for crypto, but across all asset classes. So I think certainly it's an exciting morning in the crypto community to see that year you know, long so far of losses erased and also seeing Bitcoin break out above that psychological $45,000 uh, level. I think what we're seeing is a couple of native crypto buyers like Terra buying for their own reserves, as well as now we're actually seeing in the TradFi space uh, in the CME futures, all time open interest um, on that side as well, which is leading to a little bit of a short squeeze in, in the futures um, and thus the Bitcoin prices this morning. Michael, there was a lot of talk about the fact that institutions were going to be stepping into this market in a big way. What are you seeing from institutions? Which ones are stepping up? Which ones aren't? What's really encouraging to see from our seat is really some of the traditional players beginning to get into crypto trading. Some new firms uh, like Cowan and others have begun trading crypto and offering crypto custody services as well. And on the investor side, you know, there's no question amongst investors that crypto as an asset class is here to stay. So all of the firms that they work with for advisory or for custodianship, they're all beginning to offer crypto products and services. And that's also leading to greater adoption as well as investor appetite to diversify into the asset class. Well, and speaking of how investors can get into this asset class, and you were talking about Bitcoin futures earlier, there obviously is an ETF for that. What there is not yet is a spot ETF, and that is obviously something that Grayscale has been actively pursuing. You've asked people to write into the SEC. What do you expect the consequence of those letters to be and ultimately how this is going to end up when it comes to SEC approval? Well, the Grayscale team has been putting the full resources of our firm behind converting GBTC, our flagship fund, into an ETF. It's really important that investors know that we have and will continue to advocate for them, but their voice can actually be heard through this process as well. And so the SEC has opened up this comment period for investors to advocate why they want an ETF, why it'll offer greater protections. And this is really, really important part of the process. GBTC today is owned by investors in all 50 states, and there's actually now over 800,000 accounts in the U.S., all waiting patiently to have it convert into an ETF. Michael, what do you think Gary Gensler actually wants here? What is his objective in terms of what happens next with you, with the market? Do you think he needs or wants control of the underlying market before he's willing to take the step of giving you guys that option? 
Well, the SEC has certainly encouraged a lot of crypto participants, including crypto exchanges, to come in and register with them. And Gary and the current SEC administration has moved the ball forward. It was really a very exciting announcement that we now have Bitcoin futures ETFs out in the market. But unfortunately, that's forced investors into those Bitcoin futures products because those are the only ones that exist. And so we're really encouraged by that, as well as the recent executive order Order that's causing more federal agencies to focus on crypto. And ultimately, we believe it's a matter of when, not a matter of if, a spot Bitcoin ETF is approved. If it is not, if it is denied, would you look at the option of an APA lawsuit? I think all options are on the table. I think certainly it's important that between now and the end of that 240-day process, which ends in early July, that the SEC hears from as many investors as possible, as well as academics, policymakers. Everybody has an opportunity to weigh in on this issue, and all of that is in fact considered as the SEC weighs the issue in front of them. In terms of the most likely routes to get to an ETF being approved, what does it look like? What do you think the most obvious trajectory that we're on right now. What is what do you think is the most likely outcome here? If you were to pick an outcome of how you get from where you are now to that ETF being approved, what does it look like? Well, Guy, GBTC today has been traded since 2015, and it's been an SEC reporting company since January of 2020. So every single day that it is trading and being bought and sold by investors and is not being folded into the familiarity and the protections of the ETF wrapper, we really don't feel that the SEC is doing everything they can to actually protect investors. What's missing is those last two key components that we're seeking from the SEC. GBTC could move up to a national exchange like the New York Stock Exchange, and and then could also have that simultaneous creation and redemption process that would keep the shares trading in line with its net asset value. Well, on the subject of GBTC, it has traded at a 25 to 30 percent discount for the entire month of March. And your Litecoin, Horizon, Zcash Trust also are trading at sizable discounts. Has that influenced demand at all? Well, I think what's so exciting about the opportunity around this for investors is that when they think about putting on crypto exposure, they can take a dollar and put it into the spot market, or they can take a dollar and put it into GBTC and buy Bitcoin exposure at about 75 cents on the dollar. And so investors understand that over time, if and when GBTC converts, that will converge and that discount will actually close up to the net asset value. So for most investors, there's a trade-off there, and those that have that longer-term time horizon for their Bitcoin exposure actually see it as a really big and exciting potential for them. In terms of the discount that there currently exists, is that an opportunity for you? I, you basically you're trading at a discount to the underlying asset. How, how do you take advantage of that, Michael, in some shape or form? Well, it's an opportunity for investors. As I mentioned, if you have a long enough time horizon, you have conviction that the SEC will approve GBTC and other spot Bitcoin ETF applications, then you do have the ability to buy Bitcoin exposure at a discount to the prevailing market. And you've seen that be the case where GBTC is held inside mutual funds, inside ETFs, inside retirement accounts, and today is owned by institutional and retail investors alike. All right, Michael Sonenshine, Grayscale CEO, thank you so much for joining us here in the New York studio today. Thank really you. appreciate it. And of course, if you're more interested in more crypto conversation, you can turn in, tune in to Bloomberg Crypto. That's tomorrow at 1 p.m. New York time. We'll be speaking with Melton Demirs of CoinShares and Katie Stockton, founder and managing partner of Fairlead Strategies. This is Bloomberg.